Hi guys, it's Tamara. Thank you so much for coming back to my channel. Welcome back. Today is Tuesday and we're going to be talking about unethical therapists and red flags that you have the wrong therapist on your case. So um, I think there's a lot to cover in this video and I'm going to be dropping a few terms that you may or may not have heard of. Most of these are terms that only trend clinicians hear, but you're going to learn them today in today's video. So thank you so much for coming back to my channel for those who are subscribed. And for those who are new, I encourage you to hit the subscribe button so you can stick around with us and become a part of our growing community. We do a lot of work on this channel. And I say we because although I'm the trend clinician that leads the channel, you guys talk to each other and you give each other tips and tools and you share stories and you open up on social media and I think it's wonderful. I think it's good to have at least, you know, some kind of support and to be a part of a community that really gets you. So I welcome you if you are new to the channel. The benefits for you in today's video is that I'm gonna talk about some of the red flags that you have the wrong therapist and maybe you need to look elsewhere. Who knows? So, you know, when I became a therapist about 12 years ago, uh, the first thing I noticed about the mental health profession is that there's an influx of mental health professionals wanting to help, wanting to, you know, share their knowledge and be relatable with clients and, you know, really show them that you're not alone in this world, right? That there's other people around you, even professionals who have issues. And while that's admirable, there's also a drawback because there are some mental health professionals who are not psychologically or emotionally well enough to be a therapist. Um, and that's the hard part, right? It's hard maneuvering things um, within the field because you want to believe, and I'm not saying you, I'm saying those of us who kind of serve as gatekeepers and we draw the boundary. It's hard for us to maneuver uh, some of, of, of the students who want to come into the field because we want to give everybody a chance, right? We've all experienced something and if we haven't already, we're going to. Um, and so that qualifies us in and of itself. But then you have those therapists who are really kind of iffy and they do the wrong thing and they say the wrong thing and you're questioning what their reasoning is and why they're doing what they're doing, why they have an attitude, why there's transference, right? I'm gonna put a video up here about transference. So there's a lot of different things that can come up in your therapy session. And so I think today's video needs to highlight what a bad therapist is, all right? So let's talk about boundaries. So boundaries in a general sense, it, you know, they include a line that we draw, right? It's a line that we draw to make sure that everybody is structured in, in, in their proper place, right? I have boundaries as a clinician, meaning that I can't date my clients, meaning I can't uh, marry my client's cousin, right? Uh, those things do happen in rural areas, country areas, you know, small towns. Um, but, you know, it's a conflict of interest and there may, you know, end up being some legal stuff that, that follows that relationship. So, you know, we have boundaries, right? I can't counsel my son. I can't counsel my mother. I can't counsel my, my brother, right? And the reason why or I can't counsel my husband, right? And the reason why is because it's too close of an association, right? It's really hard to be clinical and objective when you're emotionally involved. So there's boundaries, okay? The, the field of, of mental health and counseling is very gray. There's no black or white. You can't generalize everything. You really have to do things on a case-by-case -case basis and have the exposure and experience as a clinician to do it the right way. Uh, but so, you know, anyhow, there's boundaries, right? There's boundaries in the field to make sure everybody is where they are. And there's two kind of boundaries that I think you should know about, all right? One is what's known as a boundary crossing. A boundary crossing is something where the clinician, you know, kind of think of the boundary as a line, okay? A line in the sand. And, you know, a boundary crossing is when a clinician kind of puts their toe or finger over that line to do something. So an example of that may be, you know, you call your therapist of three years because you ended up in a car crash and now you're in the hospital. Well, you call your therapist and you say, can you come visit me in the hospital? Can that be a conflict of interest? Yeah. Yeah, uh, because now I'm stepping out of the clinical atmosphere and I'm meeting you at the hospital and that may signal that I like you more than I should or you may take it to mean that I like you more than, than I should, right? It may be purely clinical to me and supportive and romantic or emotional or familial to you. And so because of that possibility, it's dangerous, it's tricky. So clinicians have to pause 
and ask themselves, is this the right thing for me to do? What's the pros and cons? Do a cost benefit analysis, a cost benefit analysis. All right. So that's a boundary crossing. Uh, the other piece of this is what's known as a boundary violation and a boundary violation is a legal term and a boundary violation is I'm not just putting my toe or my finger over the line. I'm jumping over the line and I'm doing something I shouldn't be doing like being sexual with my client or adopting my five year old client or, you know, uh, getting ready to marry my client of 20 years. That's a boundary violation. There's no clear way to see that. Um, and you, you as the clinician, right, or those of us who are experienced in the field, we've, we've really crossed the line. And so all that therapeutic work that could have been done or had been done or has been done is lost. It's lost completely because now the relationship has come from therapist patient or therapist client to therapist son, therapist husband, therapist best friend. And that's tricky. So boundary violations and boundary crossings can be really tricky. And if you're not, a, if you're not an experienced clinician, uh, you can really muddy those waters and it can be really, really difficult. All right. So let's go to the next thing. All right. So then the next thing that we need to talk about is something else that a mental health professional can do that can really throw you off. And that's known as iatrogenic neurosis, iatrogenic neurosis. Uh, logotherapist Viktor Frankl, who wrote the book Man's Search for Meaning, which I absolutely loved when I was in college, he came up with a term to describe a mental health professional who not only kind of carelessly cares for patients and clients, but either causes a symptom or makes it worse iatrogenic neurosis. You either cause a symptom or you make it worse. And if you're dealing with a mental health professional who carelessly uh, engages in boundary crossing or um, inappropriately crosses a boundary and causes a violation, then you can develop symptoms. And you can develop symptoms such as suicidal thoughts, and gestures, self-injurious behaviors, depression, anxiety, even delusions, right? And so as a client and a patient, you're at, you're at a disadvantage, if I can say that, because you don't have the level of knowledge and experience that maybe the mental professional has. You also don't have the authority in the field. You don't have the credentialing or the um, years and years of experience and exposure that a mental health professional who is really qualified has. And so there's what we call a power differential, a power differential. And that power differential says society and my ethics board and my certification board and my licensing board and the state, which is who we work for basically, put us up here. The patient and the client is here in terms of authority level. And so if a therapist begins to cross a boundary or violate a boundary, things get like this. And you begin to really equalize that therapist or clinician with yourself. And you begin to have these emotions and these feelings that really should not be there for somebody who's really up here in authority in society. And so what happens is if a client gets too wrapped up in all of that, right, then they can begin to experience additional symptoms especially if the therapist creates a boundary and says, you know what, I can't, I can't be in a relationship with you or puts a boundary up and says, you know what, I'm not your mom. I'm so sorry. If that happens, then it leaves you heartbroken. It leaves you suicidal. It could leave you anxious, right? And so then iatrogenic neurosis happens. A symptom is either created or a symptom is, symptom is either made worse. And that's really scary. Okay. So Viktor Frankl talked a lot about that. And um, he basically said that if you're an unethical therapist, an unethical clinician, you can create a symptom or make it worse. Um, and that's far worse than a boundary crossing and a boundary violation. All right, so those are a couple of terms I wanted to throw out there before we jump into the red flags of therapists and what you should be looking for. I figured you guys needed to know about that. So let's just go ahead and jump into the red flags, okay? So one of the red flags of a therapist, and I think we need to look at this on a, on a case-by-case -case basis, and we also need to look at this as 
uh, number of times or duration or frequency. Okay, so all of these are not bad in and of themselves. They're bad in the sense that they happen frequently or they have happened for a long period of time. That's what I want you to keep in mind. They've happened frequently or for a long period of time. All right, the first red flag, okay, is a therapist answering their telephone right in the middle of a session. Now, if there's a crisis or an emergency and they have to excuse themselves from the session, fine. But if this is a situation where the therapist is constantly picking up their phone, right constantly like hello can I take a call oh yeah okay sure no I'd like to schedule you for an appointment can you give me one second just hold on a second yeah 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 okay oh your husband okay your husband threatened you hold on I'm so sorry I'm coming back to you give me five minutes oh really that's a problem all right <laughs> you do not want a therapist who does that okay because here's the thing number one it's a HIPAA violation because she's talking about a person who wants to schedule an appointment and she's giving clues about the situation and the person sitting on the couch or the chair may be like, wait a minute, I think I know this person, right? So that's one issue. The other issue is that they're totally disregarding your time that your insurance or your, your, your paycheck is paying for. That's totally disrespectful. They're not respecting your boundary. They're not respecting your time. And quite frankly, they're not respecting their own time as a clinician because that's just totally inappropriate. And I have seen some, some, therapists who will cross that 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 boundary uh but then they come back and they apologize or they say i'm sorry or something like that or the client ends up not coming back right so you just walk out the door um so uh yeah that's number one okay number two is eating while counseling i think eating is healthy especially if you're eating with your client sometimes i will eat a snack with my kids when they come in so like my five-year-old clients my 10-year-old clients 11-year-old clients sometimes my 16-year-old clients if we had a tough session, you know, and I have a, a tray of candy out or a tray of holiday cookies and they take one, I'll say something like, I think I'm going to get one too. Can I join you? Or I'm going to say something like, I'm so famished. Do you want a cookie? I'm going to get one. You know, so I try to equalize that and it's only on occasion. It's not all the time. So I think, again, clinicians have to be wise about how they exercise their power, that power differential and that authority. But if you have a counselor who's constantly eating lunch while you come to see them for a session, again, that's disregarding your time and your, your space, okay? Too much self-disclosure can be another red flag. I think it's okay to self-disclose. I think it's okay to talk and give it, you know, give, give some kind of experience behind the work that you do. I will do it sometimes, especially with my teenagers who are resistant or who are difficult to get through to. But there has to be a limit on that self-disclosure. There has to be. If there's not then you're going to know about their failed marriage. You're going to know about their sex life. You don't need to know that. Okay. That's not healthy for you. All right. Another boundary crossing um, or red flag may be that they take several days to get back to you. You need a therapist who's going to get back to you within hours, right? So usually I get back to my client right away if I can. Sometimes it'll be two hours later. Sometimes it'll be 15 minutes later, 20 minutes later, or sometimes two days later. But that's really the, the length of time that needs to be, you know, there between you and your therapist. But if you have a therapist that takes days to respond to you or doesn't respond to you at all, red flag. You need somebody who's going to be responsive. What if there's a crisis or you're suicidal or you're really going through something that therapist needs to be on the money on the dot ready to go okay the next one is you know they make comments um that could be or are sexual so you look so good in skirts right if a guy says that to you or if a female therapist says you know what i really like that shirt on you it's really nice no you know that's really bad and if you feel the flirtation and if you feel the reciprocal pull of flirting stop it because it's not going to go anywhere it's going to cause emotions that can't be fulfilled ever so you don't want to do that and if you have a therapist that's doing that that needs to end all right the next one is a therapist who crosses boundaries multiple times over time okay it's okay for a therapist to cross boundaries every now and then but it's not okay for them to cross it multiple times over time so an example of this may be you're getting sexual comments from your therapist every three months or every six months or every time you dress up or every time you come to therapy after work, right? So you want to look at the fact that, okay, how many boundary crossings are there over a certain duration of time? If there's too many, we got a problem. We have a problem. Uh, so you want to look at duration of time and you want to look at frequency, okay? The other one um, or the other red flag the other red flag is a therapist who doesn't manage and stop 
transference or countertransference. And what I mean by that is, you know, transference is the idea that you have somebody in your mind or in your heart that you used to love, care for. And the therapist reminds you of that person or you never had a husband like you wanted. So you make your male therapist your surrogate husband. When transference is happening, a lot of emotions get involved. And that's the video that I put at the beginning uh, as, as a like a uh, reference at the top of the video so if you go well, rhyme back or go back <laughs> to the beginning and click on that video suggestion you'll see my topic on transference um, but you know if you have a therapist that doesn't navigate that correctly you've got a problem because that therapist is going to foster emotions that should not be there and then when you start to act on those emotions that therapist is going to have to say oh no that can't happen right and so you're going to end up hurt so a therapist who doesn't manage your emotions towards them or or manage their own emotions towards you as the patient or the client that's an issue and you need to get out so that's another red flag okay another red flag is violation of con confidentiality now there's two forms of confidentiality that you need to know about one is called a consent uh, to treatment or an informed consent for treatment and what that is is it's a it's a hefty document that has a bunch of policies and regulations and all of that and it explains the pros and the cons of counseling it also explains what you're likely to get out of counseling it explains the limitations of counseling but then most importantly it explains your rights as a patient as a client and it tries not to make promises that it can't keep. So this document is important. The other document is called a release of information. And when you sign that, you're allowing your therapist to hand over personal information to the person that you've allowed them to talk to. So your other doctor, your neurologist, your psychiatrist. Okay, so those are two forms of consent. Consent to treatment, which is saying I give you permission to treat me and I know there's no guarantee this is going to work. And then the other one is a release of information, which gives that therapist the right to talk to somebody that you want them to talk to or that they need to talk to if a therapist violates either one of those you got a problem okay you signed a release of information slip but the therapist did not explain to you that if you threaten your life if you're being abused if you are in a crime ridden relationship or something legal is going on that they can go over your head you might want to question why they didn't explain it at the very beginning right so every therapist is supposed to explain to you that everything that you come to me with is confidential unless you're being abused you have suicidal or homicidal thoughts and gestures or you're into some legal craziness that I need to be reporting to the police so if they don't break that down for you that's a problem and if you forgot that they broke it down to you don't 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 raise a white flag or go around saying the therapist is incompetent because maybe you just forgot, okay? Um, but if you didn't forget and you're very clear on the fact that that therapist didn't explain that to you or didn't explain any other legal issues or confidentiality issues to you, you got a problem. You need a therapist that's going to be upfront and honest with you, okay? Uh, the next thing is texting or emailing and calling you way too frequently. A therapist should not be calling you in between sessions unless you guys have a signed agreement that you're going to connect in between sessions. If a therapist is calling you just to check on you, fine. If you had a suicidal um, you know, incident, if you had a homicidal incident, if you're really going through a rough time and the therapist picks up the phone and says, hi, Rachel, I'm just calling to check on you, that's fine. Sometimes I'll do that. Sometimes I'll even text my kids, hope you have a good day in school today. I know how bad it was yesterday. That's different, right? But if you have a therapist that's just calling to hang out with you on the phone and talk with you and and their conversation seems to be more friendly or sexual or romantic or closer than it needs to be, then you need to see that as a red flag. They're not really being therapeutic with you. They're being personal under the guise of therapy of therapeutic so you need to be aware of that okay uh and last but not least a therapist who sits in sessions with high skirts and this is for you men out there high skirts and cleavage showing that's inappropriate if you feel uncomfortable and you feel that they're not respecting you and that they're sitting in front of you with their cleavage showing and skirts way up the wazoo right then you know you need to walk out of that situation that therapist is not focused on what they need to be focused on all right, guys, so thank you so much for being with me today in Tuesday's video. I'm going to see you again tomorrow on Wednesday, then again on Thursday, and then again on Friday. We're going to see how that goes. I'm going to try to achieve that goal. I hope I make it. Um, so I hope this video was helpful to you. I think it's really 
difficult to figure out who's qualified, who's not, who's ethical, who's not, who's legally knowledgeable, who's not. Um, so I think it's important for me to just highlight that, you know, uh, these are things that you need to be aware of. So apologies for the long video, but I wanted to give you some comprehensive information. Let me know what you think of this in the comment section below. Go ahead and share this with somebody who may need this information, especially somebody who's in therapy or somebody who's thinking of starting therapy. I think they need to know this stuff. All right. Oh, by the way, you can also um, Google this topic. You can Google boundary crossings and boundary violations just to kind of find some examples online to see what that is. Okay, that might be helpful to you in the long term. All right, guys, I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.